This is Jeff Johnson. Jeff is insane. In 2007, at age 66, he walked two and a half thousand kilometers from golf to golf, from the Spencer Golf in South Australia to the Gulf of Carpentaria in Queensland. He did this in memory of his niece, Nicola Johnson, and to raise funds for charity. Not content with that, in 2011, at age 70, he then walked 5,000 kilometers east to west across Australia to fundraise $80,000 for the Newborn and Pediatric Emergency Transport Service, NETS. Then, to again raise funds for NETS, in 2016, Jeff circumnavigated Australia in his 24 kilowatt hour Nissan Leaf. And now, he's just taken a 30 kilowatt hour Nissan Leaf across Australia from Queensland to Perth in the Australian summer. Did I mention he's insane? So, Ant in Perth bought this used imported leaf from Queensland. Knowing Jeff Lowe's adventures, Jeff lives in Sydney by the way, he asked if he wanted to drive it across the country to Perth. And of course, Jeff being insane, Jeff said yes. Even though Jeff is 81 and recently went blind in one eye due to a blood disorder. So a lot of planning ensued for how far to drive each day, where to charge, etc, etc, etc. And I was lucky enough to meet up with Jeff in the leaf when he arrived in Mandra on the West Coast a couple of weeks ago and interview him. This is Jeff, the brilliantly insane Johnson's story. Yeah, Jeff Johnson. I'm uh, an old codger, 80, 80, 81. And I just absolutely love travel anywhere in Australia. I'm not particularly keen on overseas. More the outback, the uh, rural and semi-rural rather than the cities. And I've lived all over Australia, Broome, born and bred in Sydney, lived in Broome, Western Australia, Queensland, and loved every minute of all of it. And currently no fixed address, just wherever I can find myself, that's where I am. Uh, I'm a very technical person, a thing person rather than a person person. And I can fix anything, as I say on my shingle, I can fix anything but a broken heart. So I um, find myself on sheep station or cattle station, drop in for water and stay for two weeks and work in the workshop. They don't want me to leave. And I love it. I love, love fiddling with stuff. So, you, sorry, you're very much into electronics and very programming? Very much into electronics and programming. I'm still programming professionally um, in control systems. Yeah, I, I managed to uh, drive a Tesla for 18 months, the same as uh, Ants, uh, I think his is a SR Plus. No, it might be long range, but mine was a SR Plus and uh, did 85,000 kilometres in 18 months, averaged 1,000 kilometres a week. And I calculated my costs of running the car, and everything came out close to zero except tyres. It cost me $20 a week for tyres. Mm. That was not because I was harsh on tyres, it's just that I did a lot of kilometres and, um, and a lot of the electricity was free. So before you retired, um, ah. what did you used to do? Yes, over, over time, um, I did my after school training at AWA, a company that made television sets and similar electronic equipment. and. and uh, went uh, interstate and overseas for them, uh, supervising installation crews doing electronic work. Uh, and then uh, started my own business with my brother. We were engineering company making tools for tool makers, doing very fine uh, metal work, turning and milling and that sort of metal work. And, I uh, went up to, I got married and went up to Broome and I had a radio repair or electronic repair business repairing um, marine radios, marine radar, trucks, HF radios, station flying doctor radios, um, as well as uh, sewing machines and washing machines and 
such other stuff. Um, at the same time, I had a music shop up there. I haven't got a musical bone in my body, but I managed to take over a music shop where the guy was going broke and he just wanted to get out of town. So I had a music shop there for quite a while. Um, another same story, there was a chap started a very small air charter business and couldn't make a go of it, so I took that over and got myself a licence. Did some piloting in Broome for a while. And <laughs> Uh, then the uh, company I worked for part-time was the Automatic Totalisator Equipment, selling selling uh, tickets on the race course, and they were all mechanical, mechanical electrical, meaning relays and gears and levers, and they eventually went to computers because of my interest in electronics and my knowledge of how the race course betting system worked. The company put me on to uh, commission the first couple of those. So I got into uh, computer programming. Uh, I've been doing commercial computer programming for probably 20 years plus. Um, love every second of it, can't get enough of it. So um, Ant bought this car over in Queensland and you went up from Sydney to go and get it and then drive it Yes. around the south coast, or pretty much south coast mostly, uh, across to here. Do you have any uh, idea, or actually, do you have any interesting stories, really interesting stories? Any, what were the main things that happened to you on the way? On, on this particular trip from Brisbane to um, uh, from Brisbane to Perth, um, just getting organised, it was all done very short notice, only a couple of days, and picking up the car uh, in, entailed a a public transport trip from Manly to Brisbane, to Brisbane, to the suburbs of Brisbane, and to pick the car up, and and that meant a um, uh, a ferry and a train, and then the uh, airport trains weren't working in Sydney, so that was a bus, and then the uh, plane to Brisbane, and then the Brisbane trains weren't working past a certain point on the way to the Gulf Coast, so that was another bus, so I ended up getting there well after dark whereas it was planned to get there at five o'clock. So that was, that, that was an adventure just getting there. Um, and then Ant and I had uh, decided that it would be a good idea to have a uh, two, kil two kVA generator, uh, more as insurance, but if we really needed it, we could just sit on the side of the road for 10 hours and go another 100 kilometres. And so also on the same night, I had to go and pick up the generator um, and that was a challenge because the guy was living in a sort of a shack at the end of a dirt road, etc. So, so that, that, that was the first day was, was two or three different adventures in its, in its own right. Um, now, the, the little petrol generator you got um, as an emergency thing, yeah. that's a 10 litre generator isn't um, it? it, it it's 3.6 litres in the tank and I've got a 10 litre uh, container okay. as well. So 13 litres, it's about a litre per hour and it's about 10 kilometres of charge per hour. So it, I call it a 100 kilometre spare tank. Yeah. How many times did you need to use that? I, it would have been three at the most and um, if I had been as knowledgeable of the car and, and the economy of it at the beginning as I was at the end, I'm pretty sure I could have covered all of those stretches just by driving the car uh, more economically for range. And that, that is speed more than anything else, but also um, when you're going up a hill, if you want to maintain 70 kilometres an hour going up the hill, you use a lot more energy than if you go up the hill at 50 or even 40. So if you really want to stretch it, then you let the speed build up a bit going down the hill and you slow it off when you go up the hill. And I actually got 230 kilometres out of the tank at one stage and I don't think we had a, a leg that long. Wow. That required the generator, or that we thought required the generator. Um, and just for people's information, this is a 30 kilowatt leaf, uh, which has got uh, about, I think, 80 something, 87% state of health, something like that. Um, Ant can give me the details later. Um, but what, what's the normal range of this particular leaf? 
Well, there is no normal range for any electric car, as you probably know. Um, it, it depends on so many things, and the biggest one is elevation. Even one metre rise in one kilometre, in one, one in 1,000, will rob you of range. And it, it was part of the planning as to what speed to do for the next stage, as to what is the current elevation and what is the destination elevation. If it was flat, but uphill, downhill, whatever, you drove differently. And if it was hilly, although you get a little bit back if you go into regen or you let it speed up on the way down and use that momentum to get up the next one, you definitely use more energy on a hilly run than on a flat run. And that had to be brought into account. The, the wind uh, was important. Fortunately, we had um, no westerly component to the wind. We had easterly and southeasterly and northeasterly, but no westerly component. And that was a major difference as well because 20 knots of wind is equivalent to 30 kilometres per hour of, of, uh, of extra speed. So wind was important. Even if you could get no wind, it was a bonus. Yeah, so you've got a lot of experience of travelling around and across Australia because um, you're also Jeff the Walker. You walked, <laughs> you walked all the bloody way across Australia. I, when yeah. was that? Um, I, I retired for want of a better word, but I was always retired because I did what I wanted to do anyway. But in 1966, I found myself at a loose end. Not 66, I'm sorry, 2007, when I was 66, I found myself at a loose end and I listened to the radio and I heard some people doing a push bike tour from Port Augusta to Corumba, which is basically south to north across Australia. And I just started thinking about it and I thought, well, I'm better off doing that than sitting on the porch of my lovely Shangri-La out in the bush. And uh, I planned it for 12 months and I didn't like the idea of a push bike and a sore bum. And I didn't like the idea of a cart because when it broke down, all of your world's possessions were stranded. So I decided to dumb it down till it all fitted in a backpack. And I set off in 2007 and went for a walk across Australia just because I could. At 66? At 66. And what, what season? Uh, well, it was winter. Um, it kind of has to be winter. And I say kind of because a challenge would be to do it in summer. It uh, doesn't mean it can't be done, but you certainly have to make totally different preparations. Um, the, mind you, the preparations in winter, I had minus two at one stage, and that's not much fun when you're travelling light. Um, but uh, when I was on that walk, I met a group of gentlemen that were doing a old Holden bash for the RFDS, and a couple of years later, they came and approached me up on the Gold Coast and asked me would I walk east to west across Australia, twice the distance, with a support vehicle to raise money for their charity, which was the uh, Newborn Emergency Transport Service, which is uh, which was a, um, a service for uh, newborn babies up to uh, young teenagers that were in needed medical assistance. It's a, it's a special special sort of thing. And I couldn't say no, so I did that walk in uh, 2011, and I was 70 at the time I did that one. So that was 5,000 kilometres with a support vehicle. So you've done two walks across done Australia. Done two walks, so... And now you've done two drives in the leaf across Australia. I've done two leaf drives. So the first one I went right round Australia in a 2012 leaf. Uh, which is 24 kilowatt, by the way. Which is 24 kilowatt hour. Uh, and that's... That's not quite true anyway, because it never was. I never saw 24 kilowatt hour, even though it was new when I got it. Um, but I've also been across the Nullarbor in um, Combies and Beetles and Holdens, Old Holden, Old FJ Holden, and even a, um, a Tarago with a family. So I'm very familiar with all of the different stopping places and, and the weather and the lack of it. Uh, and I, I just love that, what it, no matter what, just love the adventure. And that's the reason you took this on, because you wanted I, another I, adventure? Yes, when I, when I did the first uh, round trip of the Leaf and I got to Perth and I met up with the EV owners there, and was one of them, 
and we got on really well right from the word go and I stayed in Perth for quite a while. Well actually I stayed in Collie but I have sons in Perth and so I was back and forth and went to meetings. So Ant knew me and knew of my wayward ways and travelling ways and so when he needed to get this leaf over to Perth he rang me to say would I be interested? And I thought about it for a long time, probably three and a half Turn seconds left. altogether. And so I said, yes, I'm definitely interested. And he said, we'll see how it works out because it's uh, expensive either way, whether you drive it across or whether you, whether it goes by uh, transport or ship. And I did some initial calculations. I love doing mental calculations and working out business plans. And I called him and told him what the expenses would be, including $100 worth of tire wear. Mm. And, and he thought about it all and he said, well, even if it's a bit dearer, he would rather do the adventurous thing than the simple thing. Yeah. Um, you'll have to look at that. I'm blind in the right. left eye. Hang on. You stick here, stay in this lane and off to this grey car, you're fine. Okay, cool. I hope you're right. I hate loud noises. <laughs> <laughs> so not only have you driven across Australia, um, somehow in a, in a 30 kilo hour leaf. Um, you're also um, of a gentlemanly age and, yes. and blind in one eye. And blind in one eye, yeah. And <laughs> I can't see much out of the other one because I'm old. And, yeah. Yeah. and there's a. There's let, a let me out of the car now, please, Jeff. <laughs> pardon? Let me out of the car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in technology and that includes down to minor, minor, minor details. So when it comes time to compute, I know down to the electrons, how the computer's making decisions. Right. And it depends on who, him, who I'm talking to as to what level I go to to, to discuss it with them. And that's a lot of fun. But I do the same with any technology. So when it comes to my own health and my loss of vision of my left eye, and the reason for it was a blood disease, and it was recent in as much as I was uh, 80 at the time. And the, the complications, because the, the, the conscious brain doesn't have direct contact with the pixels on the eyeball. Right. Uh, it goes through the optic nerve, uh, and it's not a nerve, it's an optic nerve bundle with possibly thousands or tens of thousands of nerves and pixels and that all gets massaged so that what gets to the first part of the brain the visual cortex what gets to that is not pixels at all it's saying that something moved from left to right or higher is brighter than dark than than uh, lower all that information is is not pixels so when your pixels your rods and cones get damaged or eaten away so they don't exist the nerve bundle is still there and still firing. And so what's traveling along the nerve bundle is what comes down your TV antenna when you've got the old analog TV set not on a channel. And so you're getting white noise. And so out of my left eye, it's by the time it gets to the part of the conscious brain where it tries to put the right and the left images together, the right image is whatever it is, a pair of old, or one old eye um, with glasses, but the left eye is noise and so it mixes the two together so it's not that things are out of focus for me when I'm driving up the road but mm. I, I can't read the number plate at this distance. I can't read either because it, well yeah that too <laughs> um, but it's, it's, it's like foggy but it's like somebody's got a fly screen in front of me and they're wiggling it. Okay uh, so but what's the hairiest thing you had to deal with when you were travelling across Australia on this, this, on this adventure? On this adventure, the hairiest. Mm. Oh, um, in a way, um, I was at Lake Grace and I called up, I called in very last light. So it was sort of dark, dusk. And there's a fast charger there and it's in a very well lit area uh, with a information type building which was locked up for Christmas Day or whatever it was and a, a toilet around the back which was well lit and I went to the toilet and I plugged in and that was all fine and while I'm sitting in the car there were four I'll say youths because it probably sounds worse but they were young teenagers young guys and they were running around and they had a torch and they were yelling at each other and carrying on 
and I felt uncomfortable. I didn't feel threatened at all, but I have what I call a fairly high conflict avoidance radar. And so my decision was that I'm better off not parked there than parked there. Mm. And that was all it was. So I headed out of town. But I call that a hairy situation, but only because of me. If anybody else would have been perfectly safe, the kids would have come over and said, oh, is that electric mate or something mm. like that. But, um, what, a, what about um, driving by the city of your pants and maybe running out of charge uh, uh, somewhere in the middle of nowhere? No, <laughs> never, never a problem. And for two, for two reasons. And uh, plan A was to plan it properly, so that didn't happen. Uh, plan B was the generator, so if it did happen, you still could just sit, sit somewhere for four hours and you put 40 kilometres in and you make it because you're, you wouldn't be out by 100 kilometres, you'd only be out by 20 or 30 or 40. Oh. The only downside to that is that even a plan B needs a plan B because what if the generator stopped working? Oh. Because then you are stuck and that's as bad as running out of fuel without a generator. Turn so. left here. So... Uh, always on my mind was what is the plan C um, so I drove to get the maximum economy that I didn't have to use the generator um, because that was the end of the line there was no plan C so. oh. but it didn't happen the generator performed perfectly I have owned two of these in the past same, same model and um so same model of generator? Same model of generator, okay. and I had two of them, and they can be paralleled up. So I was actually able to get four kVA out of two, two kVA generators, which allowed me to charge at... Um, that was on my trip around Australia in the first leap. I picked them up in Perth. And on this trip, I understand that you um, managed to add a few more places to plug share. Oh, I, I, I do. I consider myself one of the, uh, the great pioneers of plug share. Because my trip around Australia, obviously I stopped and charged at a heck of a lot of places. That And there was no, well there was a plug share, but there was nobody else going around Australia. But certainly the way I was going around. Richard McNeil went around, but he was in a Tesla. And he was staying at uh, motels and such things, whereas I was staying at caravan parks or men's sheds. Just about anywhere I could. So all of those, I probably put 30, 30 sites on plug share from that trip and uh, three or four on this trip. Uh, and not everybody, nobody said no on this trip, but certainly in other cases, people said, no, no, we're happy to help you, but no, don't, don't put our name down. Any other things that stick out for you on this trip? Um, the, the, the ability to squeeze range out of a car, out of a leaf or even a petrol car, is to travel slowly. And if you travel slowly in a 100 or 110 kilometre zone and there's other traffic, which there is, travelling in the same direction, they come up behind you at regular and irregular intervals and you have to make a decision. So if you do nothing and you're sitting on 50 kilometres an hour, you can just imagine the driver behind you seething. Mm. Um, and so you try to avoid that. You can put your foot down and go faster until you get to a, somewhere where you can pull over safely. Uh, so you, But as soon as you're up your speed to 100 to give them some relief, then you're burning your range away. And in some cases, you might have to go 5 or 10 kilometres before you get out of the winding hills and somewhere to pull over. The other thing that you can do, and I did almost all the time, is to keep a very, very good eye on the rear vision mirror. And as soon as you can see the car coming, make the decision then what to do. Mm -hmm. And it's almost lossless. It's almost cost you nothing in range to slowly slow down and pull over onto the verge and actually stop. Turn left here. And then let them go past, have another look on the rear vision mirror, and if there's still nothing coming, um, then just pull out slowly. The clue there is to, when I say pull out slowly, is with slow acceleration... Uh, and you almost lose nothing in range. And so that was my preferred method. If it's an ordinary car or a four-wheel drive, even with a caravan, uh, often I would just change my speed up a little bit so they didn't get too annoyed, so I might go up to 70, 75. Uh, and 
expect the road conditions to get such that they could go round me when they could without too much interference with them. Mm. But if it was a truck, I, I made every effort, uh, and I would say always successfully, a whole trip, um, to not hold them up at all. So if I had to go at 100 kilometres an hour and stay 10 car lengths in front of them, that's what I did. Um, if there was a section ahead where there was a crest coming up but there was nothing before the crest and I'd slow right down and pull over to half a lane and let them know um, that they could get around me before we got to the crest. Mm. So uh, that was a lot of uh, mental activity <laughs> uh, to maintain the, the, uh, the range. So you were hypermiling it? As much it definitely hypermiling and also I worked out fairly quickly that if I drove at a moderate speed, 70 to 80 kilometres an hour, and then watched the instrumentation to see how much range I had left and then adjusted my speed so that I would get to the destination, I found that I got much better range down at the 50 kilometres an hour. And so if I had a long stretch to do, I actually set out at 50 kilometres an hour. Mm first light and off I would go and then I got up to over 200 kilometres range whereas previously I was stretch, stretching to do 180. And were, were you sleeping in the car every night? Or did every, you... every night yes. Um, I had, uh, I, was gonna, I thought there was two, certainly uh, from Hunt Day. Uh, Tim's place up? last night at Harvey. Did you have a lot of people asking you about electric cars in the middle of nowhere? Yes, every every time, every time I stopped any caravan park anywhere, I always always got questions. Some of them were normal, supportive people, yeah, EVs, blah blah blah, and some of them were the other way and say, oh, I travel I travel 1,200 kilometres a day, but never suit me. So there's a few of those, um, but it was definitely a mix. Um, we were talking about earlier, actually, the person, the tradie, who said he drove 1,200 k's a, yeah, a day in his youth. I mean, that's just impossible, isn't it? It is impossible because 1,200 kilometres, if you could average 100 kilometres an hour, it's 12 hours and that's daylight. So when did he stop and have a pee and when did he do his work if he's a tradie and he's servicing something while he's travelling around the countryside? So, yeah, uh, but that's, that's that sort of person always exaggerates their requirements. It's like people say, oh, I can't have an EV, mate. I go 600 kilometres every year, four times. And no, they've been twice in four years. So, um, uh, but we, 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 I mean, all electric vehicle drivers take that with a grain of salt because mm. they just know that's, that's what some people are like. Um, if, did you want to give a shout out to anybody that you met along the way? <laughs> oh yeah, there's lots. Um, the, the, the people that stand out the most, I'm talking about the professional people at caravan parks and roadhouses, almost all of them, and I mean 9 out of 10, 19 out of 20, they were very, very supportive. You're right mate, go and plug in, come back and have some lunch and we'll see you when you get back. And even a few of them, and quite a few, so oh, don't worry about the electricity, you're going to have lunch here. So other times uh, they would say, well, yeah, how long are you going to stay? I'll be at four hours. And they say, yeah, well, $26 for an overnight charge. Yeah, well, I'll get the four hours. I'll be, you know, about $5 or $6. Yeah, okay, mate. Yeah, $20, $26 overnight charge. So yeah, they don't know. Uh, and almost always they don't own the caravan park. They can't make that decision. They're just the manager or somebody working uh, for, for wages and probably not much wages. Yeah. Uh, and they can't make that decision. So yeah, any, any shout out to any particular place or any place you think definitely you guys need to stop here on the way if you're traveling across Australia? Um, <laughs> uh, well, Narragin is the, is the foremost on my mind, but it's the last place where I stayed, but it's a council caravan park where they've spent millions of dollars. There's no other caravan park in town. And most council caravan parks with a caretaker of some description are usually bare. They're, they're 
they, they do the minimum. Uh, but this one has everything. Everything was paved and everything was shiny and... Turn right here. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I was uh, very, very pleased to have stayed there. Uh, and they couldn't do enough to help me out. And they were just managing a park for the council, so... Yeah, they're, 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 they're definitely differ. <laughs> I'm not used to the traffic. I see all of those cars. Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, you hardly saw a car across the whole of Australia, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I saw three. <laughs> I've got a car in Sydney at my sister's place in Manly, which is a suburb, and even street parking is almost impossible. And I just catch public transport everywhere because it's, it's easier. It's because of your health issues you had to sell your Tesla Model 3, didn't you? Yes. Um, it, it wasn't necessarily essential, but I wasn't driving it, so it was parked outside. And my financial arrangement with it was that it was consuming three quarters of my pension, and I was living in it, and I could justify it. But while it was parked outside doing absolutely nothing, it was hard to justify keeping it. Mm. And it's only a car. And the, uh, the price of second-hand Teslas was through the roof. So uh, it was an easy decision to make. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm a whatever it is it is sort of guy. So if, if it wasn't a good idea to keep the Leaf anymore, it wasn't a good idea to keep the, uh, not the Leaf, the, the Tesla anymore. Yeah. And so I accepted it, just like I'd accept it. If they said you can't have a driver's license, your eyesight's not good enough. That, that's it fine. is what it is, yeah. It is what it is, yeah. And, and because of that attitude, oh, I'll tell you a story about that too. Uh, because of that attitude, I live a stress-free life. Mm. I, I was in hospital, flat on my back for six weeks, with drip going in, trying to keep me alive and kill this bloody blood disease bug that I had. And one day, three nurses came in to do whatever they came in to do, change the drip or feed me or do something. And I was jesting with them, and I'm on death's door. And one of the nurses was not particularly busy, and she said, what, what's the gear? What's the go? <laughs> what, 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 how, what, how can you be what, you know, so cheerful when everything's bad? Mm. And I, I, I looked her straight in the eye, and she would have been 20 something or other, and I'm an old codger. And I looked her straight in the eye and I said, I don't give a shit about anything. Turn left. I live a completely stress free life. And that's the whatever it is, it is attitude. I've got a very good mate up on the gem fields at uh, Ruby Vale, and uh, whenever I go up there, I stay with him these days, had my own claim up there for a long time, and uh, I was up there, I don't know, a year or so ago, and he said to me one day, he said, you know what, he said, you've taught me one thing in life, <laughs> and that's what it was, mm. don't give a shit about anything. If things go wrong, they go wrong, you fix them or you don't. But... So what's next, Jeff? Well, that's a good question. Um, there's a uh, there's an author, well known, movies made over his books, etc. Lee Child, and he writes stories. And his antagonist, I think's the word. I've only worked out what it means the last few years. Uh, the, the lead guy in the story is a retired U.S. SAS equivalent type guy. Protagonist. 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 Thank you. Antagonist. Yes. <laughs> not an antagonist. No. Although he is. Uh, but he he, he, um, he he is what he is. He's a big brute of a guy, and he's ugly, and he's got scars. And, and but he lives the minimalist life in America, just wandering around, no no fixed abode. Doesn't have any clothes in a cupboard. Doesn't have a cupboard. Doesn't have a house. Turn right here, the roundabout. Right um, so when when the set of clothes he's had on for three days gets dirty, he just goes to. The, the cheap shop and buys another pair of jeans and two shirts and off he goes again and carries a toothbox, a toothbrush. Anyway, he gets into trouble everywhere he goes, so he'll turn up in a small town because he's just going through from one place to another and he'll help somebody that's down and out or in trouble or somebody's bashing a woman or something 
and the cops will end up getting called and because he's such a big ugly bastard they're on to him straight away and eventually the, the cops will say well what are you doing in oh. town anyway and turn left at the lights and he says i've got to be somewhere so he's, he's making a, a logical statement that mm. if he wasn't in this town he'd be in some other town that's, some other cop would be asking him you're talking about jack reacher aren't you yeah that's it jack reacher jack nun reacher he's the man so the answer to your question is, what am I going to do next? I don't know, but it won't be nothing because <laughs> I have to do something. <laughs> I have to be somewhere and I have to do something. It will rely a little bit on my health. I have a, uh, a, a treatment once a month at the hospital in Sydney. I can get it in any hospital, but it's silly to chop and change around the yeah. place. So I might as well be Sydney. Right hand lane. Right hand oh, lane. Yeah. Right hand lane, yeah. When, I when had it ready. lean and I couldn't quite got it, but oh, I got sorry. it just afterwards. No, no, I got it just and afterwards. Turn right at the next right. And um, uh, so I, that's a monthly thing. So I, I can do any of my adventures. I can plan a month at a time without any trouble. Mm. Well, how long did it take you to get across Australia? I mean, uh, this time, about seventeen days, seventeen, eighteen days. And I left the day after my infusion at the hospital, so that was on a Saturday, and I caught the plane on Sunday, so, so I had a full month before I go back. The next uh, hospital appointment was the 6th of January. That was the plane from Sydney to Brisbane? That was the plane from Sydney to Brisbane. It was on Sunday, and I got there on Sunday evening and drove out and stayed at a mate's place in the car um, at Aratula, which is just short of the Cunningham Pass out of Brisbane. Mm. heading towards Warwick and New South Wales. Turn left right here. So um, you've had some experience, you've got all of it, obviously knowledge about EVs, uh, quite in-depth knowledge about batteries, chemistry, software, etc. Yeah. What, um, what do you think are the top EVs worth buying in Australia? Best value for money? Or? Yeah, yeah we actually start off with best value for money. Yeah. Um, okay, it's not an easy question because money means different things to different people. To, to most people, and I mean by number, uh, the MG or the um, Atto 3 at under 40, 000, under 50,000, 44, 45, 46, is got to be a very good buy for electric vehicle if they're not the sort of people that say, oh, I've got to have a BMW because of the badge, and likewise the Tesla. Now, the, the, uh, the other choices like the Tesla and um, Mercedes and whatever, they're very definitely good value for money, but they are outside turn, of, of purchasing power. Turn right at the end. Of the majority of the people. The biggest problem uh, before any of those questions can be answered is we don't have the cars for sale. They're just not for sale. You can't go and buy an MG or an Auto 3. They don't exist. Well, they do. It just takes a while to Yeah, get, well, that's right. But that's... Get one. So a lot of people make the decision based on what they can get rather than what they want. Yeah. And that negates the question, what's the best value for money? Because they don't get that. And it's not just electric vehicles because people are waiting six months for a a four-wheel drive worth $80,000 and they end up buying something else because it's a six-month wait. Uh, it's actually a 24-month wait for a yeah. hybrid RAV4. Yeah, yeah, the RAV4 is a good example. But yeah, obviously there's a lot of waiting for some EVs as well, depending on how many they get into the country. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the Kia are bringing 100 in at a time and, and they're sold in 18 seconds or something. So. Uh, but the RAV, the RAV4, the postmistress lady uh, at uh, Sapphire Post Office, she wanted a RAV4 and, um, and they told her what the time was and she was lamenting and pulling her hair out for a month and they rang up one day and said, we just had a cancellation, do you want a RAV4? She said, what colour is it? And Doesn't they matter. said something, and she said, oh, okay. <laughs> and so she got a road for it. So um, if you, you know, had money, let's say you had whatever money you wanted to, mm, but you didn't, you didn't want to go stupid, 
and just waste money. What, what would you buy if you could buy an EV right now for range and features and whatever else? Yeah, it, it would definitely be a Tesla. It would definitely be four-wheel drive, and it wouldn't, uh, and long range, because that's all they come in, but it wouldn't be the sports. So... Uh, Which Tesla? Pardon? Which Tesla? Oh, well, uh, Tesla's, as far as I know, three model. Oh, uh, Model 3. You get the 3 over the Y? Over the Y, yes. Why is that? Uh, because I don't need the Y. Uh, the Y is a bigger car, um, and it, it doesn't do anything for me. It gives me space, but I don't need space. I understand it's a, mm. a CUV or hatchback or whatever it is. SUV. Yeah. SUV. Um, there's, there's some flexibility in what those terms mean, but um, I, I just don't need it. Uh, I probably wouldn't mind the extra ground clearance, but it's not a lot, uh, and I do go off-road more often than I should. In, in ordinary sedans, and I've been known to take a hold up over a sand hill that people wouldn't take their four-wheel drives over, <laughs> and I pride myself on it being driving technique. Um, but uh, for so, that, yeah. turn left here for this roundabout. For that reason, the 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 Y would with that extra clearance. But I mean, if you really wanted to, you could put a lift kit in a Model Three and spend the extra money. Um, but I'm I'm. Just Turn in, right here. Just not into um, SUVs. Okay, so that, that's the big tell. If you're not into SUVs, obviously you're not going to get the the Y or the Atto 3 or the MGZ SUV because they're all SUVs. Um, you get a Yeah, that's true, but the, the, the MG is, is a very small one. Uh, I'm sure I, when you look at the wheel wheelbase of these, I get quite surprised that they're the same wheelbase and, and yet they look smaller. Final question for you, yes. just as we park the car at um, Rob, Rob's house. What's your advice to people? Um, just life advice. Give, life give us advice. some life advice. Mm. Well, I'll go back to where I was and say don't worry about things that you have no control over. I have a 5% rule and 5% of what happens in your life is outside of your control. It'll piss down rain when you're trying to do some shopping or whatever. But the other 95% that happens in your life is your reaction to that 5%. In other words, if somebody pulls in front of you on the highway, you can either yell and scream and tell your friends about it and send off SMSs, or you can just move back and say, next please. And you'll be a much happier person by by just have, obeying the five percent rule, just say, "Yep, yeah, tough." That'll do. If he wants to get out, we can move. Um, and I have probably over have no respect whatever for material goods. Um, just before we go, thank you, um, Jeff. For, thank you very much, sir. Oh. Thank you very, very much for. Yeah. Allow me to, to chat with you and meet with you and ask you stupid questions. Yeah. Um, but yeah, looking forward to your next adventure.